What's up, all my beautiful dudes and ladies? I got great news for you. You're about to hear a two-hour interview where I'm the guest on The Philosophy Guy with Brendan Weber. You might remember Brendan from a few episodes back where we talked about idealism and panpsychism. It was a great conversation, so I would go back and check it out if you haven't heard it yet. It definitely constitutes a part one of sorts. Anyway, Brendan was cool enough to let me post this conversation on the Interverse RSS feed, which is really helpful because I don't have an episode out for you guys yet this week. There is another one coming soon, though. I've got it in the works. So in the meantime, sit back and enjoy this part two of my talk with Brendan Weber. And I think there's going to be a part three coming soon. Anyway, this conversation is a lot to do with new age spirituality, the problems and pitfalls and the positive elements. And then I go into a pretty lengthy <laughs> discussion about archetypes and about idealism and the philosophy of mind, as in that the universe is an entirely mental construct. So buckle your seatbelts and get ready for a high-flying, philosophical, fantastic conversation with Brendan. Thanks so much, Brandon, for letting me copy this over to my feed. Can't wait for the next time that we get to talk and do this again. It was great. And don't forget to go check out The Philosophy Guy if you like Brendan. He's got tons of episodes you can get into. I'll make sure and link that in the show notes on this post. You can find his show everywhere that podcasts are served pretty much. And all right. Thanks for listening, everybody. Enjoy. have you explain the new age kind of the the new age movement what it means to you around spirituality and then also kind of like what's your interpretation of what the culture thinks it is because it's a very hot button issue <laughs> yeah right on man okay so you asked me to come on here and talk about my perspective on what the new age movement is or is all about uh maybe dispel some of the some of the incorrect ways of thinking that have cropped up with the new age movement <laughs> or what, you know, what is humanity currently even evolving into right now? Right. There's the idea that a lot of people that you might label new age have about where the world's going. And then there's the actual reality of what people are becoming in this moment. <laughs> mm-hmm. So, so I will mostly criticize things that are thrown into the new age movement camp of ideas. And it's not that on the whole, I'm against exploring consciousness or exploring alternative spirituality or exploring deep metaphysical or philosophical ideas. I'm actually all for that. The problem with the new age movement is it looks like a whole bunch of miniature cults that are part of some bigger uh, interconnected network. (laughs) And I don't mean cults like scary, evil cults necessarily. I mean cults in the sense that almost everything that people believe in and follow blindly is essentially a cult. And with the new age movement, it's mostly a lot of self-proclaimed gurus and experts that are leading people to sort of take what they have to say for gospel and not question it that much. (laughs) It's very similar to just a new form of priestcraft, but where the old mystery school traditions of initiation are swept away. And it's just like whatever this guy says goes, who's got a lot of followers or Mm -hmm. who can get a lot of people to buy his books or come to his seminars. And this is not like a blanket statement downcasting everybody that is a teacher or uh, considers himself a healer or is in any way out for the greater good of others when they're engaging in this type of work. It's definitely not a complete blanket statement about everybody. It's a more of a criticism of the people, the masses uh, and their tendency to flock. (laughs) That's where we, that's where we really have a problem. I'm looking to the outside to be saved from our problems. That's where religion ensnares people. And that's where a lot of the more crazier and 
kind of even pointless dogmas that come out of various new age teachers leads. It's, uh, you know, the self-help book craze, again, that's like a big part of it. And you have multiple things going on there. You could possibly have subversive elements that actually want to undermine particular traditional ideals of society for whatever mm -hmm. nefarious ends they, they might have in mind. I'm thinking specifically of in the latter half of the 20th century when the Cold War was on. We, I mean, I'm not like going to talk a lot about what goes on today with Russia did that, China did this, but it was the same back then. And the agents that were trying to defeat of their opposing forces and in particular, like in the United States, the exterior enemies of that nation were looking to do whatever they could to subvert the things that made that country strong. So general cohesiveness of a single religion, a problematic as that may be in a dogmatic sense and in what it leads to with, you know, crusades and things like that, mm -hmm. it's still sort of a, a unified strength and getting everybody quabbling over small things that you know the aliens the, the gray aliens are good the gray aliens are bad all that stuff is just sort of like a distraction and divisive mm -hmm. and on the other hand some some of the books that came out during the last 50 years that would be about these topics have straight up ideological bents to them like maybe the person was contacted by these amazing human like alien beings who then essentially explained to them the exact ideals and tenets of communism, but without calling it that things like this. And then you're injecting uh, ideologies into different pockets of the population and researching where that goes. There's a lot of social engineering, I think at play with the new age movement. Hopefully that's coming across as far as what I'm trying to explain here. And yeah. that's just a, like, that's just a small part of it. Um, the, and you talked about like what you, you asked about what you think, people see it as and again for this is referring to the masses not to like the individual seeker of truth but the masses are looking for a remedy to problems like to actually have a uh, handrails and and guards around every part of life no sharp edges nothing that can go wrong just give me a lane and i'll stay in it you know don't let, don't let me think for myself and try to figure this out for myself you just tell me what it is, what's going on. So I think that's what, you know, as, as far as how the, the average sheeple would see their spiritual guru or whatever of the week, it's that exact thing in a lot of cases. It's I'm stressed out by life itself. I don't want to actually engage in the dialectical process of eliminating the behaviors and mindsets in myself that are causing me problems. Um, and then moving on to the next ones, I want the ultimate end all be all answer and no more of this questioning at all. Yeah. And yeah, I agree with like a lot of the, I guess you could say sentiment and, but I also like the way I, cause like the way I see new age, and I feel like you'd agree with this is it's basically what you kind of said, people that are seeking, Hey, I have problem X. Oh, this new little movement can solve my problem X. So they go and like seek that out. And then there's also just like a lot of people. And I think it really brings in a lot of people. And maybe this is why it actually runs into some issues sometimes is it's kind of people that used to be <clears throat> part of a religion, for example, and they left their church, but yet they're kind of still seeking that spiritual connection in a way. So then they go and find like, okay, where, where can I find the, the next great guru, you know? Um, so yeah, but like, and, and I agree with the the idea that there's like all these like little little sex in the in the new age movement of their favorite guru, their favorite self help book, their favorite X Y and Z, right? And kind of may, not really like I don't know if it'd be pushback, but it, maybe it kind of is, is in the sense that I, I see it as a way to like bring people in to the good stuff. So it's like they, they kind of get their intro and you need that like nice big canvas and some of the stuff's a little bit of some bullshit, but hey, it like gets them into that canvas. So maybe they can come into maybe where it's a little bit the more open side of the fold. I don't know if that's that might be a little bit too vague, but uh, but I also like really agree with your idea of like how they 
I feel like a lot of people come in and they think like, oh, it's like this this one path to this kind of spiritual connection or higher existence and solving all my problems and being content with life or whatever. And it, it kind of like brings it back to, um, I'm trying to think of the quote, Krishna, Krishna Murti's quote about how, uh, how do you say it? Like truth is a, truth is a pathless land, right? Where, where it's like people come into this and they, they think like, oh, I'm just going to, I'm going to take this one path. This is what you do. This is how you become enlightened. This is how you do it. And they think that's the way it is, but you've already lost if you've done that because truth, like truth is a path, pathless land. You can't just expect, have that end goal, right? And the Buddha talks about this too. Um, and I just find that like really interesting. That's one of the problems I think people run into is they just think I need X to achieve Y, but really you've already lost if you think you found the answer to your, to your questions, right? Absolutely. I think when we see the the vast array of options available to us, it can inform us a lot as to what is really happening when it comes to like the diamond dozen metaphysical teachers or energy healers and all that. And again, not that I know a lot of people in those fields that are excellent and they are someone worth listening to, but the it's symptomatic. I think of maybe spiritual consumerism is a oh, yeah. term I would coin for that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and the, the problem with spiritual consumerism versus an actual authentic spiritual quest is what do you do as a consumer when you go to the grocery store, you buy the stuff you like and you don't buy the stuff you don't like usually, unless you're a conscious critical thinking agent, then maybe you'll buy something that you don't like so much, or you'll buy something that costs more than you'd like to spend, but because it's actually what's best for you or what is, you know, going to give you the most health. I think the same thing is important. That kind of discernment is important when you are exploring any kind of ideas at all. <laughs> but the back to the pseudo Christianity thing, or what I would call pseudo Christianity, the side of um, the new age that has that component. And in fact, actually lots of people who dive deep into the new age wind up coming out the other side, even more entrenched in the religion they started with. Mm. And that's an interesting phenomenon as well. It's just, we in the new age people have the same kind of dogmatic ideas uh, and external blaming the external for for whatever is going on in their life as they do in religion and you'll hear it all the time someone will be like ah the universe must not have wanted me to get that job or i hope the universe allows me to do this and the truth is you are the universe you're the one who's going to either allow something to happen or not allow it i mean yeah there are external circumstances maybe someone won't hire you for a specific job but that doesn't mean you can't and aren't able to be the thing that or play the role that that job entailed i mean there's going to be a, another opportunity if you make it for yourself so to really sum up part of the problem with spiritual consumerism i would it like pick and choose solipsism where an, a person who is looking to just eject problems out of their life and not realize that problems are the whetstone that sharpens the sword of your consciousness <laughs> and it's actually really important to have them not that you should like create unnecessary problems for yourself but just embrace the fact that when you solve one thing there's going to be two more things to solve that actually is the beauty of life it's like a tree twigging out and branching into a bigger and more full expression of the seed that it once was. So mm-hmm. solipsism though, to define that term, it's when you basically decide what's true for yourself rather than letting empirical reality decide what's true or inform you of what's true. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah, that's something I think really does happen with a lot of, especially the, especially the more religiously bent ones, as far as the new age goes, that people will just, adhere to a teacher that has the the saying the things that they want to hear a lot of the time i mean i've been guilty of it so let's just be clear on that i know about this primarily because i've swam in these waters and luckily as a critical thinker i've been able to navigate the bs side of things but not always i mean you don't know what's bs until you know and you don't know how you're (laughs) deceiving yourself or in denial until you wake up to it so i think that's like something you have to be aware is a tendency in yourself and uh, allow for that in your 
in your reckonings. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's like having a, having a concern still for, or I have a concern, I can tell you have a concern. And it's a big issue in this is, it's it's like one thing to have basically those people finding that guru to follow, right? And they kind of blindly follow that. And I, I say guru in a very vague term. It can be like a person. It can be a text maybe. It can be like various forms. But I'm just going to use guru in that vague way. But like there's also people that come into the movement, I feel like, right? It's kind of spiritual movement. And there's a lot of people with big spiritual egos. And it's like one of those things where – the, this new age movement around spirituality, it's, it, it used to be kind of like this really underground thing, but now it's like, it's, it's becoming really public in a way and really popular because the business world has taken hold of it. Uh, people that used to be part of more strictly part of religions have taken hold of it. And it's just, you know, it's less, it's way less underground. So then with, with consequence of that, you have a lot of people that are coming out of the woodwork in a way And kind of like going back to your earlier point of like everyone now considers himself a guru. I was was like hanging out with some people in this kind of this similar circle to around this stuff. Right. Let's let's say that. And um, we were like talking about shamans and how, you know, various various people have like gone through ceremonies and all this stuff and they're doing ceremonies and then all of a sudden you like you find yourself keep saying, oh, and now that person's trying to become a shaman. Oh, now, now that person's not trying to become a shaman. And like when you're in a conversation and everyone's just starting to think they're, they should become a shaman, it, it kind of, I don't want to like say they're doing it disingenuously because that's part of like, I feel like my ego coming out in a way. But it's also like all these people are just like popping up and thinking, you know, they have like this, they have the truth and they have the wisdom and now they're going to go out and th- like they think they have the the authority now basically to do this and they want other people to follow them and it becomes like kind of this like weird ego game almost and i don't know if you've had like like a similar experience as well i definitely have in my own personal life i mean when i first started breaking the mold of the I, the religion and the ideas that i was brought up with mm-hmm. it involved exploring shamanic tools of a bunch of different kinds and shamanic ideas and honestly there's no need to like label yourself as now i'm a shaman unless Mm -hmm. you need that label as a tag on your website so that people can buy shamanic services from you or or whatever right Uh, this is maybe coming across too negative what i really mean is that we all can and should embrace shamanic the shamanic toolkit which involves looking within, which involves going on journeys with your consciousness with sometimes right. it involves plant medicines and often involves ceremony. And all these things are really useful tools. And actually it's overall a great thing that more and more people are being exposed right. to them and embracing them. But like whenever it becomes an identity, an ego identity type of label that it's off putting to like, even if you mean it authentically, going around and like boasting about um, being a shaman or being a a guru or whatever, if it can come across as that you are disingenuous or insincere, you're defeating the purpose of helping others. If you're turning them off from even connecting with you by sort of the shell that you're putting around it, I guess. So it's a tricky, sticky subject. I mean, I have friends that call themselves shamans and I'm in no way, annoyed or consider them (laughs) disingenuous for doing so. And I just think that it's maybe good to be realistic about where you're at in your path. Like maybe when you're quite early on in the path of learning and practicing healing arts or healing tools or divinatory arts or just becoming a teacher, which in truth, we all are both teachers and students to, to somebody somewhere at some time. the just don't get don't get bigger than your britches i don't know why i want to say that but <laughs> uh you know like be humble about it that's a better way of putting it be humble about it and if someone if you synchronistically are in a place to be able to help somebody and use the, the shamanic toolkit that you've picked up and practice it and be of service that's great and i hope that you do take that opportunity but when it comes to marketing yourself, I'm 
it's just like a gross thing, whatever it is, whenever we are turning our vocation, our craft, our creativity, our imagination towards the pursuit of a recognition or monetary gain. It's, yeah. A, yeah. it's a tricky line to walk. So just, Very you know, true. we should be all be aware of that and see how we do it in ourselves. I mean, part of the reason why I became a podcast host, I, I realized after I was doing it for a while was because I really wanted people to think I was cool and smart. <laughs> <laughs> and I still do. I can't help it. That's like natural. Right. We all want to be recognized and loved. So like, I, I guess be humble about it is, uh, is always going to be a, a good thing. It's never going to be the wrong advice probably. And, you know, more about specific elements of the new age that lead us into trouble I, or, or like obvious red flags, I guess is a better way of putting it. Look at the law of attraction as a perfect example This book comes out, it blows up all around the world. People are like, oh, if you want anything, you just have to think that you want it it, hard enough. And it gets interpreted as like, I can manifest myself a Ferrari. That's always the thing that people say to rip on the law of attraction. But there may, in fact, be quite a deep truth at work with the concept of the law of attraction. But it's deeper than just think about something enough and it'll happen or you'll get it. And when it comes to that specific book series, if it was such a perfect method, why is there always the next book in the series? <laughs> like, yeah. Oh, you, you almost had the law of attraction, but the reason why it's not working for you is because you haven't read this book yet, or you haven't subscribed to my, my course yet. I'll teach you how it really works. And I mean, that's just to me, point blank, obvious, uh, set off my, BS meter. If someone wants to talk about the law of attraction, I'm not against it. But I personally always want to say if there's one thing you can add to the law of attraction is the law of action. Thinking will not do much in and of itself unless (laughs) you've become truly mystical Spider-Man level superhero psychic power magic person. (laughs) And then maybe it will, but I'm not there. Yeah. And it's like, um, yeah, like I'm trying to like think out a word this. Kind of like going back to your earlier point, and then I'll branch off into what you just said there, because I, I agree with you in the sense that that it's like not to be all negative about this stuff, because I think, you know, like I was said before, or I think I said before at least, the positives outweigh the negatives in this, but I think it's important to tur- to to examine the p- potential negatives because like like we were saying about like the shaman stuff. I think it's important for people to at least be mindful as they're they're going through their journey. Like, am I ready for this? Is this my my role or whatever it is? Right. So it's like it's like that idea of being mindful, and then also, yeah, like the law of attraction thing. Like when you oversimplify, kind of like that book does, you risk, you know, people people also being able to make fun of it when they it's not the full concept, it's not fully expressed correctly or whatever, it's not the full picture, right? So not only do you have people that think, oh, I just have to do this. And then all of a sudden when it doesn't work out, they're like, oh, fuck, I just got to buy that next course or buy that next book. And then I'll, then I'll have it figured out, right? And then you have the other side that are like, oh, look at like these these little woo-woo fools over here. Oh, they think they're just going to like manifest a Ferrari, right? So it like makes it really open to attack in a sense. Oh, it creates polarization. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. That's a good point. So it... But then it causes the, materialist people to maybe dig in even more and be like, man, I don't want to be anything like that person who's exactly. so flighty and maybe wasting their time or their money. And then the truth, like, it's good to just be more in the middle. The mm-hmm. honest answer about how to attract what you want is to like work for it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I it's mean, like, that's a, it's the, a fact. Yeah. The, like the mindset and the, the, kind of manifesting idea is like, sure, you, you alter your mindset to be in a state. Of, and I'm, I'm not saying like a Ferrari is a good thing to strive for because I would, you know, but this is my personal opinion about where I am centered, I guess. <laughs> like I wouldn't strive for a Ferrari, but let's say you are striving for a Ferrari. You can't just like think about it and it's going to manifest. No, you have to think about it. The point is, is like your actions and your, the, what you're manifesting in your mind and what your mindset is, you still need to act towards that. The, the mindset is just stage one. Like you got like one tiny piece of the puzzle and there's a lots more pieces to go. Right. It's that like that idea, but also 
I'm split too because there's that polarization issue, but then there's a part of me, and and I and trust me, like I'm fully willing to criticize, like like you said, like a book that says I have the truth in this book, and your whole life will change, and all this good stuff. But you need to buy my four other books and my co- and subscribe to my course for twenty dollars a month, and blah 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 blah, right? Uh, but the flip side of that, to like play devil's advocate against myself, what I said is. We also want to bring people into the fold because there is an argument to be made that that books, that book series and other related type of stuff brings people into these kind of ideas that were seen in the underground. Although maybe maybe we could easily argue that it's there's more negatives in the sense that they have this like really biased view. However, would that would their eyes ever have been on it to begin with? So it's like. Although maybe you're kind of bringing in some, I don't, I don't know if the right word is corrupt mind. I don't like saying that. Like it's really, it's really opinionated on my side, but like in a way, corrupt mind comes in and they're biased towards it and they have kind of their strict views around what the, these ideas are and what new age is and what spirituality is and all this stuff. But like I was saying, their eyes are now on it. At least we got them in the door, just they're in the door in a biased way. So Maybe like what your thoughts are around that idea. I think that's a good thing overall that the conversation has at least shifted. Right. Unfortunately, if someone's decided they already know, even if it's just based on knowledge and not experience, then they are going to roll with that decision until at the very least until experience shifts them or they decide to make a conscious choice to choose their choose a different belief. But that's rare. But the, you know, to talk more about, law of attraction specifically what we are really talking about in like eastern mysticism you call it cities or spiritual powers and it's always been said in those texts like the the vedas that you would actually lose the city or the power by trying to consciously wield it or control it Hmm. you can't do that and that ties into the philosophy of taoism really strongly and yeah, something like sure. <laughs> that uh, I really like the concept of the Wu way, which is non-action. And it doesn't mean you don't take actions. It means that you don't really try to force things. You just, when the time is right, you act accordingly is a mm-hmm. better way of putting it. So I'm really Wu Wu as a person, actually, <laughs> as, <laughs> as skeptical as I might sound in this conversation, I can manifest friends at a music festival of 20,000 people that I'm looking for by waving a crystal in the air and singing a song about their name. And then they'll just like be at the next place I go randomly, or they'll walk up within five minutes. Or I I have so many memories of things like this happening that are completely improbable and based solely on me having an intention and me being in a flow state and not caring what happens and just like blissing out you could say (laughs) that i i have trouble uh getting to the end of describing stories like that i mean a a short anecdote would be for example one time i was going to a stage at a large music festival where security checked your bags and i happened to have a few magic mushrooms that i had found earlier in the day like on the ground and the security person took them away. And I was like, ah, well, whatever. If I should have those, then I will. And I don't have to have those exact ones. And what ends up happening after I go into the stage is so someone at the stage gives me a larger bag than what I had had taken away from me. And now this isn't to say I'm like constantly uh, on mushrooms or doing psychedelics all the time. It's actually been a long time since I did a lot of experimenting with those because I feel like I opened enough doors that I've had plenty of things to explore in those new places. Then, uh, then I need to go try to open up more doors and windows right. in my mind, <laughs> I, but they're useful. And sometimes that's part of the shamanic toolkit we're talking about. It, those, you know, substances like that plant medicines have been a part of the shamanic toolkit forever. So I, I, if you want, I could tell more weird synchronicity stories, a lot of them involving festivals. But I think listeners, if they started paying attention in their own life, they could notice when things happen that are really improbable, that were just based on them having a certain intention and happening to be in the right place in the right time for that intention to be fulfilled. 
And it, it, if you're not looking out for it, you won't notice it, but it's actually part of daily life, big and mm-hmm. small things. It's a power that we have. That is really what the law of attraction is about more than, <laughs> more than about being able to magically wish for something like you had a genie. Right. Yeah. I, I agree. And it's, yeah, it's like, it's like what works for you too, as well. Like you have your understanding about how that works for you. And like, who is someone to say that your experience is wrong? Cause like what we have is experience in a way that's, that's all we have. Right. <laughs> so to kind of like sum up new age in a sense, so we can shift gears a little bit, but my idea of it is, is like you see spirituality as whatever you like you, you, but the point is you kind of seek out knowledge from various perspectives and various paths, kind of like going back to Krishnamurti. It's like you don't go on one path. You see where the path takes you and you don't let it let it constrict you. Like, oh, this is the one way to do it. You kind of find your personal connection to, to a higher calling your own way. And also it's like you don't close yourself off to ideas either because like even some people within the New Age movement – I think would be like, oh, like what, what chance to say, well, you just said, oh, that's, you know, that's BS, right? Some, some, there's like, there's like this, as we brought up the like various sects in the new age, there's those sects that are very much more, I would call like secular. It's more about like just meditating and all this stuff. And they would just say, oh, that's like a bunch of BS. And, but it's like, how, like, how do you know that? Did you, were you there to experience it? And are you mindful of like those actions in your life to see if those manifest in that way? You know, it's just like, it comes back to, for me, is what I wish, and maybe I'm trying to, like, take the term back, but it's like, it becomes, spirituality becomes what you want it to be, but also understanding that you can't just follow one path. You have to follow your path. And I think maybe that's, I don't know if you think that's a good way to sum sum it up. (laughs) I think so, and... The secular tools available from the new age, ironically, are not new at all. A few of them are new. (laughs) There are some technological adaptations that are interesting, like uh, cranial magnetic stimulation. There's a thing called the God helmet that can induce transcendental experiences in people. I've heard that. There's some definitely some new stuff in there, but that's more like science than new age. Right. And at the end of the day, as far as the the existence of the new age as a whole is, it's kind of just like a new cage, <laughs> or <laughs> that's a good or way to put it. Actually, connect it to the uh, new world order concept. Yeah, because if to me, I I see society hurtling towards some sort of one world government, one world spirituality. Even if that one world spirituality is pure solipsism, which is to say your spirituality can be or your truth can be whatever you want it to be. There is no sing, there is no absolute truth. So uh, you know, like the reason I, I'm so skeptical, another reason I'm so skeptical of par- one sect of the new age in particular, which is like the UFO, alien abduction, alien contact, alien channeling, all of that stuff. I'm not skeptical that people have ad- abduction experiences because We've had stories going back since the beginning of human folklore about being taken away by the fairies or elves or diminutive humanoids and going to other worlds. That's all definitely something going on there. But whenever we get all these books about people channeling the third dimension or the the 15th dimensional Pleiadian command council (laughs) and, and all this, like, okay, you might be talking to something in you might think that that's what it is, but to make a big movement around it is to me just kind of like gross and silly. And also as soon as we start saying that the aliens are going to come save us all they're they've got their ships cloaked in the, around the orbit of the planet. And any minute now they're going to come in and take out the corrupt governments and replace everything with, wipe out everyone's debts and make everything perfect again. That's just more outsourcing of your own problems onto an external thing that is essentially like a deity because it's got powers beyond your comprehension in your mind. These aliens do. And the, the opposite is just as problematic. The, 
this is a bigger part in Hollywood and in pop culture than it is maybe in the new age, but there is definitely an element of it in like in these particular alien oriented sex of the new age, which is that the aliens are going to destroy us all. There's reptilian shapeshifters that are undermining everything good about humanity and enslaving us and all that. And this, first of all, it smacks of Gnosticism, which I have a lot of problems with the idea that the world is a prison or that there's an evil demiurge controlling everything. And we can talk about that more, but just the idea that there are, potentially other species out there that are going to come to earth and do to us what we've done to, well, not, I shouldn't say we, but what certain groups of humans have done to other tribes or less advanced uh, groups of people. That's a great othering technique that works just as well as coming up with the idea of the barbaric German during world war one, when the propaganda machine was trying to get, the United States into a war with Germany. It's the same type of othering at the end of the day. And it leads to a, a very similar uh, destination as what I described a few moments ago, which is like a one world government, because if you have that big of an external threat, then you definitely need a super big daddy to police everything and make sure that we're strong enough to repel the invaders. And anyway, to, to me, both, both sides of the coin that the aliens are going to save us all or the aliens are going to destroy us are ridiculous. And if such beings exist, then they would be just like us, in my opinion, which would mean some would have good intentions. Some would have bad intentions. Some would act individually. Some would act as a collective. And at the end of the day, it's just not useful uh, information to me. And I say that with, you know, some, regret because it's a lot of fun to imagine what's going on in the cosmos and right. actually have uh, many friends and, and people have even been on my show that have sa said, say that they have contact with this group of ETs or others. And in a lot of cases I interpret it as they're more like spiritual beings or other dimensional rather than physically in our universe per se. But uh, again, I don't think it's super useful. If it's for that individual, something that helps them tap into a tool or a city or a healing modality and is legitimately helping them assist others, I'm all for it. I'm not going to like negate it completely. But to me, it hasn't been something I've needed to research a lot. But oddly enough, I've had more than one person who is psychic or sensitive or channels or, or what have you have given me the same background for myself as far as like what star system I'm from, what kind of star seed I am, which is a, I say that with maybe too condescending of a tone. Of course, if we're, <laughs> especially if reincarnation is as true as it seems to be, then, you know, maybe we were somewhere else before here and we could have lineages and all kinds of far off reaches of various galaxies. But like I, I like the pragmatic and the practical side of spirituality, maybe even a more secular spirituality like you mentioned, and that doesn't need to overly worry about past lives being the reason for all my problems now or invisible demons or angels or aliens that are either helping or hindering me and just boil it down to like, how am I helping myself or hurting myself? And for, that's the only thing I have control of anyway. So I feel good about sticking with that. Yeah. I like, I actually really like the way you put that at the end there of like, kind of like this. this yeah. <laughs> it's like one of those phrases that uh, I, it comes with a lot of baggage as well as we were talking about new age, but yeah, like this, this secular spirituality where we kind of leave out the more woo woo stuff. Like we can recognize it and it's really fun to talk about and all that. But also, like, just be wary of it because when you're kind of telling, saying about the aliens on both sides, like, they're just going to come and destroy everything and they're going to come and save us both ends of that. My immediate thought was the way religion operates. Like, because cause on, my, on, our, on my show, the philosophy guy, we on my, like, solo episodes, I've talked about trying to, like, make this separation of religion and spirituality. And yeah, what I heard was is the way religion does it. I, I see it as a kind of people like to place their their fears 
and their kind of ambitions even and their little safety net into this little deity. But then it really doesn't do anything to address any problems. It's just like, oh, this this is going to happen when so-and-so comes or this is going to happen when so-and-so comes and burns us all to hell, right? And I see that in Christianity, for example. Um, But even the concept of deity does have some positive potential in that agreed it's it just like anything that you're doing that's got a magical bent what it symbolizes to you is sort of like attracting that to you and not not necessarily attracting that to you but you are going to act in a way that exemplifies that Mm -hmm. so if like you really venerate a particular deity whose main aspect is compassion then perhaps you're going to act with more compassion because you're inspired by that or right. because it's your chosen symbol. So it's not like, it's not completely worthless, but it's just about, it's like I think it's important. Act. Yeah. It's, it's important that it's like you realize that this force only expresses itself through you. It's not externally out there pulling any puppet strings. Yeah. And, and, you, and you also just made me as we were like, this is slightly a side note. Um, but like as we were talking about uh, this kind of like the new age spirituality stuff, but also I just kind of I was like thinking I was like how do very religious people kind of view this new age movement? And Pew Research just it was it's a couple years old now now that we're in 2020. I think it's only a year and a half old, so the data is still pretty new. But they did uh, uh, like some polling, and what I kind of find fascinating and I don't even know how we're going to like talk about this. We can just kind of, I just kind of want to mention it and then we can leave it at this, but like Christians actually, you know, so like new age, they kind of vaguely ask this question of, you know, do you think things in our, in our world basically have like this spiritual, I don't know how they phrased it, spiritual vibe, I guess you could say they have spiritual energy. That's probably the best way to say it where everyone will kind of understand where, where, where we're coming from. And of course, you kind of had the new age crowd that were most favorable to it by far. And then you had like the really uh, secular crowd that were the least favorable, but like really close to them was actually Christian conservatives. And to me, I found that really fascinating because, you know, they, they believe in a sense in some spiritual forms and some form of deities. Like, although, you know, I pushed back on them as well, but like, it's, I found it fascinating that they think that this kind of like, I, keep, I, I don't want to say the new age crowd, but it's the best way to kind of get where everyone's seeing the umbrella I'm talking about. But they're really willing to criticize them, but like their own kind of spiritual tent of what's going on. Oh, that's that's complete, complete BS. I just find that kind of logical leap really, really interesting. But. Yeah, and it's just, it's really coming down to an important dichotomy in human consciousness and behavior, which is the individual versus the collective. The person that is absorbed in a particular collective or group is going to have all kinds of cognitive dissonances and logical fallacies because like we said in our last time talking, the crowd is untruth. I mean, it's the definition of it. So I think that that is what's really coming to play there. But You know, I will say I did kind of rag on people contacting entities and channeling and all that. I will I will say I want no one to cease and desist exploring that type of information or practicing that type of stuff for themselves. If they're interested in it, if they're having results that they find super valid, it's even better. I'd actually like to hear about them because I have heard about stuff that does seem more real when it like people remote viewing and finding information that is very true or channeling some stuff that it definitely doesn't seem like they themselves could have wrote, but is super wise or super useful. Um, Really spirituality. When you look at the word, the most completely ignored thing about it is spirit. Spirituality is the study of spirit and therefore spirits. So Mm -hmm. that's what I think is important for us to keep in mind on our own path is like how, how is spirit part of our path? How, how is, what is spirit to us? Are, do we, have we experienced spirits before? Like 
these are sort of simple questions and going to have a wide variety of answers for everybody. And some people are going to have a categorical no to that, but others are going to say they've had ghost encounters. They've Mm -hmm. been spoken to by the voice of a deceased loved one. I mean, I think it has a lot to do with our degree of openness to it, just like being able to see synchronicities or think everything is out to get you type of thing. It's your perspective or your mindset that is going to inform that. But yeah, I think studying spirits and spirit itself, like, and defining that for finding the definition to that is really useful. <laughs> and that's an important part of our path. Yeah. And I think we kind of talked about this on the last interview, but like my mindset is also is, you know, it's people have basically their way of phrasing and using their language to express things. And, you know, like basically spirit encounters, for example, or experiencing ghosts or having a, a loved one that's passed away, talk to you or whatever it is. It's like, to me, if they experience that, they think it's real, it's real in some sense. Right. And then like, we can find ways to explain it or maybe connect dots to things and all this, but for them, it's real in some sense. And I think that's like the important aspect. Cause yeah, like I feel like in some sense we are coming across as negative, like both of us, but I think it's also important to be, to like have a conversation about being mindful about the way we're, we're doing certain things and expressing certain things. So it is like important too, because at the end of the day, we're trying to like, you know, the way I see it is try to help people relieve suffering in some way. So it's like, how do we, how do we help guide that in in a way too? So it's like the important discussion to be had. Right. Um, But I would like to like kind of transition to kind of stick with this idea of spirituality, but maybe apply it to the ideas we talked about in the last interview where I feel like we got into this a little bit less. We kind of got into the ideas of panpsychism, idealism, kind of on the more, I mean, we still leave it on the philosophical level, but maybe apply it to some way on the spiritual level because I think it could have like an interesting tint about maybe even like bringing more people into the fold and also just kind of explaining some of these things in an interesting way as well. Absolutely. Awesome idea. <laughs> I, I'm happy to segue into a little bit more about idealism and panpsychism too. I throw idealism in because I think that if you're going to have an umbrella term where the people and thinkers and geniuses that have been thrown under that umbrella are mm-hmm. pretty consistent and represent something useful to look at, idealism is definitely one of those things. Yeah, But the basic concept of both idealism or panpsychism is that all is mind. Mm -hmm. And I would take, I mean, that means that literally everything is mind, including everything we see as physical. Another way of putting that would just be everything is spirit, which is a fine word substitute. In fact, you could actually just say psyche, which is another word for soul. It actually means soul. All is psyche maybe, but who's psyche or what psyche is the question here. Is it that we're all inside the mind of some super God or is it that it's all the same mind and we're just experiencing a part of that mind, but because that part of the mind is literally who we are and what we use to experience things, that means that we are that same as that, which is the all, Mm -hmm. which I think is personally, I, I find that to be very true. And the more I explore, the more I experience. Very true. And a a really important element of this is that it's not just mind, like the type of thinking and cognition that most of us are constantly in, that that's not the foundation. Like the conscious mind, thinking, sensing, feeling, reason, that's not exactly what I mean when I'm talking about mind. I actually mean pure imagination. That's what the actual fountain that everything else comes out of is. I like to say it all the time that thinking, imagination isn't a type of thinking. Thinking is a type of imagination. Right, yeah. Because everything we experience comes through in an imagistic way, and especially everything we think. But reality is generally imagistic. And there's a really cool concept from the poet Samuel Taylor Coleridge, that also J.R. Tolkien was highly inspired by when he was creating all the many incredible things he created. But it's the concept of the primary imagination. And Coleridge says, 
The primary imagination I hold to be the living power and prime agent of all human perception. And as a repetition in the finite mind of the eternal act of creation in the infinite I am. That's kind of a hard thing to parse, <laughs> it's that, that quote, but <laughs> it means it, it's saying quite a lot, which is that it's sort of like you can look at it like the concept of the platonic realm of ideals. Mm. That's what the primary imagination is. It's like the canvas for all the rest of reality to spring from. It's the source of all the images of consciousness and all the various offshoots, be they different types of senses or feeling. And when we are hmm, creatively <laughs> enacting with our conscious mind, some, some form of imagining or building something or making something, bringing something to be, we are using something actually called the secondary imagination, at least in this Coleridge metaphor, uh, at least specifically for the artist is who's really using the secondary imagination. It has to do with dissolving, diffusing and sublimating the things of the primary imagination, the stuff of the world with your own conscious choosing of elements blended with those that unconsciously arise. So a way of looking at the, this ability that humans have and that the artist is constantly engaging in is that they've created like a perforation between the dividing line of the conscious and the unconscious. And they're, things are seeping from the unconscious into the conscious through this relationship that they've created in their own mind. So <laughs> Uh, it's yeah it's it's a it's really fun way to look at things that everything is actually one great big imagining but the important thing to know about the primary imagination is that it's like automatic so although our minds are the same mind stuff as all of the mind in the reality mm -hmm. uh, we aren't necessarily waking up in the morning and saying i'm going to generate the tree in my front yard and my entire house. And I'm going to imagine everything in the entire planet earth, even stuff that I'm not aware of. That's what makes it the primary imagination is that it's like, you could call it the consensual reality that we all share. It's the dream that we're all in it at the same time. And it's generating, it seems to be generated of its own automatically, but with this power of the secondary imagination is where we're actually doing this thing that, that, that new age talks about all the time, which is manifesting. I mean, even the fact that you could, that the first person who ever built a chair out of wood did that, that is a, <laughs> an amazing thing. When you think about it, where did that even come from? And Plato is a great place to look at for, for more of this idea of forms and versus ideals. And that's maybe kind of philosophy one oh one or stuff that your listeners are familiar with, mm -hmm. but where I think idealism is most important to, or what's most important to take away from idealism isn't any one author or person's breakdown of the architecture of the psyche or anything. It's just that this idea that all is mind is, has something behind it. And the perspective has been alive in occultism and magical metaphysics forever. So it's not really a new yeah. idea although it's beginning to show up more and more in physics and science. And in some cases, as if it's somebody's original idea, <laughs> <laughs> maybe that's why I'm against new age is because a lot of the best ideas are quite old, but there are some, like if there are some really amazing romantic era poets like William Blake and William Wordsworth, who can teach you as much about life and yourself as the greatest physicists of today could or spiritual teachers. And that's just in their art which is usually allegory, but it, it's containing the seeds of something bigger. One guy, there's one guy I wanted to introduce you to that's a modern physicist, philosopher, author guy. I didn't know if you've heard of him. Do you know of Bernardo Castrup? I have not heard of him. Oh, you got to look this guy up. He has a lot of books, but one that I really like is called Why Materialism is Baloney. How True Skeptics Know There Is No Death and Fathom Answers to Life, the Universe, and Everything. And this guy was like working on AI systems and a high-level theoretical physicist himself and was deeply entrenched in the whole materialism worldview for a mm -hmm. lot at the beginning of his career just to 
fit in and make things work. But eventually, I think through some of his own experiences, transcendental experiences of popping out of the framework of the smaller self and into a more universal form of consciousness temporarily allowed him to see how how idealism is a, a good descriptor of what's actually going on here in this reality. A metaphor that I really like from him is that a whirlpool in a stream is essentially what the brain is in the medium of mind. So the world, like if you look at the entire universal mind or the primary imagination as this flowing river of experience of, of feeling of the stuff of reality that as we experience it, then the whirlpool that's created in it has, and the many whirlpools are like our individual minds where the bottom of that whirlpool vortex tornado is actually our point of aware consciousness. It's all uh, collected in this sort of spinning singularity in the whirlpool. And you can't see above the edges of the whirlpool. And that's why, <laughs> that's why you don't see the, the rest of your mind. It, you're in this little container. You're taking the shape of the container. And the brain is a lot like that. It's folded yeah. in on itself in all these ways. Like, the structure of the brain actually does represent the metaphor of a, a knot or a whirlpool really well. Um, and that's why practices like meditation or things that bring you into a, a state of stillness can lift you up over the edge of that whirlpool a little bit and to the universal mind because it's a stillness that you're achieving and maybe you're temporarily s stopping the whirlpool or shrinking it a little bit. And the, the metaphor is really apt. I mean, that's why p whirlpools that are near one another experience similar things and can report the same reality because the same part of the waters, if you will, are flowing through both whirlpools at the same time. But I, I highly recommend you check out Bernardo Castrup, you and anybody listening. Really awesome writer. You can find him as a guest on a bunch of different podcasts. He has a ton of blog entries that are maybe i'll try to have him on really <laughs> yeah if you do i'll be mad because i've never asked him on because i'm too intimidated by how smart he is but i really should too <laughs> <laughs> no i'll definitely check him out and you should send me over a link so i can put it in the the show notes as well for sure for sure yeah because I, I like the idea of it's almost like when you brought up kind of getting over the walls of the whirlpool for example it's like kind of my understanding of mind, both of what science is saying about it and, and yeah, basically to use what science is saying about it and what kind of you're saying about it is, you know, for example, like meditating, it quiets your mind so you can get over. It's like our brain is so active. It's like, we can't, we can't see over those walls. And it's like the same thing uh, with uh, like psychedelics, for example, it actually like quiets your mind. Your brain becomes basically less active. So then all of a sudden you start seeing way more, right? And I find that aspect really interesting as well and kind of like agreeing with that um, philosophy side of things. Uh, but where, where do we want to go with this? So basically, yeah, like, and this is where I want to, to, to tie in panpsychism with it too because the reason I find it interesting is because what you were like saying about idealism, I was like trying to think, uh, to like fight for the, not fight for as well, I'm like fighting for this ism, but panpsychism, I know it's not new in a sense, but it's like, it's newer, I would say than idealism. Cause there, there's like a lot of idealists out there, like, uh, Manuel Kant's basically an idealist. Cause he had his, his, uh, categorical imperatives that would fall under that umbrella, um, that the foundation behind that would de like, would need, it's like all his mind is kind of the foundation of that. And you have, who else? Schopenhauer's um, prototypes. So those those type of ideas are really agreeing with idealism. But then you kind of bring it, what I, what I kind of find interesting about the panpsychist side is it brings in this, this science side of things where you can almost say like, yes, like our perception of everything is very much kind of all is mind. It's like the idealist perspective. But it's also not saying that the physical doesn't exist. Like our interpretation of the physical comes through the mind. So in that way, all is mind, but it's still saying that that physical side of things that where 
it's almost like there's like the separate dimensions of the two. They still coexist and they still, I think, would fall under this one large umbrella maybe. But the idea is that our way of seeing that falls under this more idealist idea of the mind manifesting all that stuff. Like that's how it comes into fruition. That comes, you form the picture of it. So I don't know what you kind of think of that idea behind it. Well, the mind manifesting all this stuff, I think that makes a, like manifesting the entire universe all the time with your mind. That seems Mm -hmm. like a lot of work. And I like it better if we just consider that the physical reality and all the objects of our experience and our observation are just, they just are. That's uh, <laughs> they, they just are already there. They are what they appear to be in a sense. They're not, um, there's not like, I don't like the way Kant has been interpreted, although I don't know if he would have intended for this, but that you can't actually know things for what they are, that there's always the separation yeah. of them being in the mind and being categories of the mind as if you will. <laughs> right. I, and I'm not a Kant expert for my listeners. That's why I have not covered him because that's like a whole can. I'm not ready to open. <laughs> oh man. Yeah. Well, I'm not an expert either for, for sure. In fact, most philosophers, and this is the, the sad truth. Most philosophers, we know more what other people said that they said than what they actually said. Very true. <laughs> Especially when we're I'm, talking about Plato and stuff. I'm super guilty of that myself, yeah. but, but uh, to the metaphor of the whirlpool again, I think that, well, with panpsychism, some people interpret panpsychism as meaning that everything's conscious, but mm-hmm. the actual word would mean panpsyche, pans, it, it's like that everything is spirit or soul or, mm-hmm. and so that doesn't necessarily make it conscious as a self-reflective form of consciousness. And the reason why I want to return to the metaphor of the whirlpool is not that we should use a metaphor as the truth, but it's still a pretty good metaphor for what I think about this in that you have like the walls of the vortex that form from the vortex action. And those could be akin to mirrors facing one another where the images in those mirrors are reflected back and forth. And our brain is structured that way with the left and the right brain that we can even, that even allows us to think about the act of thinking. Mm. So if everything is mind, it doesn't necessarily follow that everything is thinking or self-reflectively thinking at the least. Everything can, things can be a thought without being an active thinker, if that makes sense. I only want to uphold that idea or concept because I feel like it's more parsimonious and simple of an exclamation explanation in science or philosophy as soon as we start making more miracles than the primary ground of philosophy which is that everything exists at all being the first miracle (laughs) the the more miracles we throw in or the more unprovable assumptions that we can't observe i think we go into the weeds a little bit so yeah i agree uh, i i like i i do like panpsychism I don't like the idea that maybe everything is thinking or conscious, but that everything is mental. I can definitely flow with that because uh, I've even had the experiences myself of popping up to the top of the whirlpool a little bit and being able to feel the thought of what it is I was seeing or experiencing uh, without being able to, it's hard to even describe that state, but it does exist. Like there is a state like that and the fact that we can travel out of body to real places and get real information not not that everyone can has the skill to do it but we all have the potential to do it mm-hmm. i think that's that's also a, a good I, how could you swim out of your body through the air and see stuff and be conscious if you weren't still in the same stuff that you are when you're in your body if that makes sense Right. And, and, the yeah. mind stuff. Like and, I personally have only a couple of times, but during points of my life where I was doing a lot of the spiritual practices have been able to achieve an out of body travel where like I can see myself below my point of perspective. I can float around the room. I haven't gone very far with that 
it, it kind of freaked me out, but <laughs> it's <laughs> the fact that those experiences are accessible to us, I think is a big point in the idealism column and like a death blow to materialism, but it can only be dealt by the person for themselves because you can't give someone else your experience of an out of body travel. Right. Which is why it's hard to, to argue to the materialists on that side of things. Um, but yeah, and, and not to like, I want to kind of try to, to do some clarifier and then you can give me some pushback maybe, but like the way, the way I look at panpsychism, for example, yeah. And what I mean by, um, not to retread tracks we already did in the last interview, but uh, panpsychism in the sense of where I, I view it is, is, and this is going off of kind of my experience in, in a high existence, I guess you could say, um, and not saying how I got there, but <laughs> um, <laughs> just high existence does not mean high to any, you know, um, so it's, it's like this idea that, yeah, you're, you're right. Like, for example, you know, some panpsychists, and this isn't all panpsychists because there's various sects within panpsychism that like, uh, like the table that I have all my stuff on here, you know, some would say that it has some form of like conscious energy, but you're right. It's not like, it's not like it's has the same as we do. I think a lot of people see it as consciousness inevitably means that they're experiencing a similar view of life, essentially a view of reality the way we are. And that's why we say, Oh, like animals are closer to us and we, and all this. And then now some are saying about like plants, for example, but it's this idea that there's like some energy to it. And I'm not saying I'm willing to say like my table here in front of me is, but it, it opens that door for plants having some sort of, I would, I, I like to say, I guess at this moment, it might change it as I learn more, but like conscious energy where it's very vague in the sense that there's just, there's energy there. It doesn't mean that it's reflecting and it's making choices and it's doing all these various things. Right. Um, but going to those like that higher states of basically awakeness, I guess you could say is that feeling that, and this is where I, you know, I still like some ideas and idealism, for example, is you can feel it as though you're, you are just the mind. Right. And in, in that sense of you are just feeling consciousness and kind of like what going back to that, that other episode where I still think it connects with panpsychism is because it's like, I, I think there might not, I'm not saying we can ever discover them, but it's those like psychophysical laws that maybe are out there that we just don't know about because there is this like physical plane. And then there's this very consciousness energy plane, but the feeling is that they're connected and they're all pulling from that one source of energy to kind of create all of this around us. So it's kind of that idea where, where it's, that's why I kind of align more with it maybe than idealism is just because I just feel like once I, once I got my rational brain back on, got out of the, the experience state, <laughs> um, you just kind of start putting the pieces together and you start noticing the connection between the physical and the conscious. And you might write seeing that it all has various levels of energy, but it's all pulling from one fundamental source. And maybe that's like to do the quick definition of panpsychism is the way I interpret it is it's like all of reality is like pulling from that source, but all of reality is still pulling from that one consciousness at different levels. But it's not saying that they're all like, like a, this table in front of me isn't necessarily experiencing something. Right. So I hope, I hope that if that makes sense to you, hopefully it makes sense to the listeners. Yeah. Honestly, I think that the way that we're, talking about idealism and panpsychism make the terms pretty much interchangeable for us yeah. here. And I totally agree with what you're saying that there needs to be a way to tie this back to, you know, energy where, where things are coming from, why they're structured the way they are, how that mm -hmm. is working. But we can actually observe in ourselves that ideas themselves carry energy. And therefore you could say ideas are energy Mm. And materialists good, already good have agreed that matter is just a form of energy. So if ideas can carry energy or transmit energy or they are themselves energy, then that means it's not a big stretch after all to say that the table in front of you is an idea. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. And, and she's like, for example, I normally am a 
pretty close to going to bed by this time of night where we're at right now. I'm often just like lounging and loafing and real lazy and sleepy acting, but I'm stoked. I'm fired up right now. And it was just from the idea that we are going to have this engaging, interesting talk about ideas. Right. <laughs> but a more maybe visceral example would be one that I've heard given by a teacher that I like called Seven Bomar from uh, Secret Energy. I do recommend that side. It's pretty fun and a lot of good ideas there. But he uses this example all the time that if I came to your house and convinced you tonight that in the morning I was going to give you a hundred million dollars. The only catch would be that you have to go to sleep and I'm going to watch you all night and make sure that you are asleep and you don't wake up at all. And you don't, <laughs> you know, that's going to be hard to do. You're going to be so, even if you are super tired, you're going to be so excited. And maybe money is a, a base example, but it would work. I mean, you would be yeah. super thrilled to have the idea of all the freedom that that money would give you and what you're going to do with it first thing in the morning. And it would be hard to sleep legitimately. Yeah. And then there's of course the energy that comes through emotion. And usually, at least for me, whenever I have an emotional reaction to something, it almost always follows the thought like I'll never see them again. And then I'm boom, sad. The feel that, the visceral energy of that. So, right. you know, the emotion has a bunch of flavors of energy that do completely affect and influence your bodily energy. So I think we could, we could probably exhaust this more uh, fully if we wanted to, but to me, it's not a stretch to, to consider ideas and energy to be cut from the same cloth. And then boom, you've got sort of a grand unifying realization between the physical and the mental or ethereal realms they actually have a very direct tie together and they are of the same stuff yeah and that's where yeah maybe they maybe i just need to understand idealism better as well because yeah like i i definitely see how they can be almost interchanged because like you were explaining about how someone had the idea to create the table for example and the, the table came so you could say the idea had the energy and in some way the energy is transferred to the table because it originated from the idea, right? So yeah, it's like, yeah. So you it's just like, blew my mind. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like the way I, the way I take that is is why I'm trying to like connect this to why they're all. I don't know if I want to say interchangeable yet, just because I'm too naive. But like, let's let's put forward the possibility that they could be because it's almost like they're they're ways of explaining it. So like the way I just explained it would be how I, w- I would say an idealist would explain it. Right. But the panpsychist would say a similar thing about how not only is it within the idea, but the table is now physical. So now you manifested from the idealist all is mind world and you manifested something into the physical world from your mind, from the ideal world. So it's almost like they are interchangeable in the sense that panpsychism is almost what I see is focusing on the physical side of things. But the idealist is not denying the physical side of things, but it's more focused on the mind side of things, which I actually kind of find really interesting and kind of just had that realization in this conversation. Yeah, maybe the difference would be that idealism would put mind as the primary right. thing. Mm-hmm. And in truth, though, it's probably something like they co-create one another continually yeah. because our I think ideas. They're interconnected, yeah. And that goes back to the idea of the primary imagination and then the artist using the secondary imagination, which is that inspired by what is seen or experienced or available in the world, which is this type of mind energy. Mm -hmm. They are then using their mental idea energy to create something new, to synthesize something new. Yeah, exactly. And that's what I find so interesting about these, both of these ideas because, you know, and this is coming from someone that I don't want to say I was ever, I, I never like to say I was ever an ist because I go through them so quickly. And now I've just realized I can never align myself with one because I'm just going to like, don't want to become dogmatic, which we definitely covered in the, in the last episode. But yeah, it comes to just being able to explain so many, not necessarily explain, but give you give you something to bounce off of in a sense of the mysteries that we have out there, something to, to feel like you can almost like push off of. 
And yeah, a ground. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like you need, like, and to me, you it's need grounded. something reliable, a ground reliable, because like what I always tell my audience and stuff too is like, yeah, I'm always remaining open, but it's like you also need to kind of pick some ideas to bounce off of. You need a ground because if you don't have a yeah, ground. Yeah, I mean, maybe just, in four years you'll be completely off of this platform right. and on something else. But I agree, man. I think that you can still explore a wide variety of eclectic thoughts and even talk to people that don't have the same ground as you while right. standing your ground. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And that's what I was, it's like, it's like you, what I tell, I, I tried to find like the best way to explain it is like, you want to remain open, but you also don't want to be just like a pushover. You want to still fight for some ideas. Right. Cause otherwise to me, you're just never really gonna, there's, there's, you learn something in a way by defending certain positions, I think. It's like it's it's about not doing it dogmatically, but yet still defending them because it almost gives you a better understanding, right? And I think that's like really important in a sense. But yeah, yeah. And also, if we're considering these ideas to be a form of spiritual consumerism, then if you're at the grocery store all day but you never buy anything, you'll eventually starve to death. <laughs> <laughs> that's a good point. Yeah, that, actually, that's a great way to put it. Um, I was trying to think of kind of the analogy related to this kind of idea, maybe I can insert it here, but it's like, how did I word this? So it's like you have a big bowl of, let's say, let's say marbles for this example, that you kind of, you kind of place your bets in things is the way I say it. Cause you know, I I keep saying that I like the ideas and idealism, but maybe I align more with panpsychism, but it's like, you still kind of place your bets. So it's like, no, I still like, so I'm going to give a couple marbles basically to, to idealism. So I think many people find ideas and they put all their marbles in one basket too often. And that's where you kind of get the dogmatism issue, but mm-hmm. it leaves them. What happens when you do that? Because the way I see like the marbles, they're, they're time that you spend on stuff, right? You have a limited resource of time. So, but so basically by putting all your marbles in one basket, essentially to use that phrase, it leaves them with nothing left no marbles left. And as like humans, once we kind of give a piece of ourselves a marble, it's hard for us to take it back because it's time. So we need to be, what I like to say is like, we need to be mindful of where we put our marbles and how many we give to various ideas. Cause it gives us the opportunity to a like remain open to ideas by not giving too many marbles to one idea, but also you still get to kind of you feel like you're pro- you feel like you're making some sort of like evolution in your thought by having enough to kind of continue to distribute throughout your life. I don't know. Yeah, man. It's if you put all your mar- <laughs> if you put all your marbles in the basket that Jesus is the savior and he's coming back to exactly fix the world. Example. Yep. And then somebody comes up and they're like, "Hey, did you know all- that Jesus was actually a character based on astrology and the entire New Testament is a form of?" tracking the stars and specific constellations are being described as allegory throughout the whole thing. In other words, he kicks the shit out of that basket. You've just lost your marbles. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, then, you have and nothing then, like, to fall back on. Exactly. And then that's like another way to put it is like what happens when you put it all in one basket, where do you left? That's when you hit that extreme existential crisis because all of a sudden all your marbles were in one, your entire, your entire you, your entire truth, all of that just gets knocked over with one. And I'm not saying it never does. Cause what also happens when you put all your marbles in one basket, you become super dogmatic and you find ways to defend putting all your marbles in that basket. That's like but the, the person issue. that that happens to it's, ends up yeah. most of the time, just jumping to another authority essentially yeah. like that, that type of person is the most easily swayed into a bad government idea or join a, that's very join true. up in a military or I mean things that could be very destructive to their life or maybe even cause them to do harm to others or jump into a crazy yeah. cult and drink the Kool-Aid. You know? It may be, it may be like a, an example to connect with that is it's like kind of like going back to the, the marbles idea, but like connecting it to the idea of like a bad gambler who let's say they go all in, right. And then they lose, but then they like, they have the, it's like the gambler's fallacy actually. <laughs> Where they feel like they need to get that back. So they're they're like, they go all in again on something else. And all of a sudden, it's just like this cycle of getting basically fucked over because they they weren't mindful enough in a sense. And I, I try to say mindful enough in, in a way that's not egotistical, but like they just weren't mindful enough of aware enough of like, hey, step back. 
I don't know shit about the world. Hmm. What what would I do now from here? Now that my whole foundation just got destroyed. Uh, but yeah, and, and the I, example- I'd love to talk a little bit about what causes like some of the root causes of that particular type of person that gets really caught up in a order following or a dogmatic worldview or mm. something that's even toxic or harmful for the planet. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, yeah. And to me, and I definitely want to hear your interpretation of how this happens too. But uh, the easy example for me is always religion because it's something I'm still analyzing just because I'm fascinated by it, especially with myself getting more into the spirituality side of things. But I still see this really, I have this really, I don't want to say really negative, but I do have, I have this negative opinion of particular organized religions. So yeah, I like to analyze those in a way that how do they come to just be so trusting in a way of the beliefs they hold? And what I keep coming back to is, is like religions have to use methods when they're children, because children is when you, you mold so much, you mold your entire understanding of truth, understanding of the world, how the world works. And also it's, and religions happen to use methods to suppress going outside of that box, going outside of that view. So then all of a sudden you're, you're what you go through the education system, you're, you're 18, you get to college and you're maybe finally starting getting exposed to new ideas a little bit more. That's a lot of time and a lot of decompressing and peeling away the layers that were building up around those ideas. So, I mean, that's my simple version of the explanation. Well, one thing we see in society right now is massive infantilization more and more. I mean, I, again, I'm guilty of certain things myself. I'm 30 years old and I still play a lot of video games, but that's not, com- maybe that's not completely terrible, <laughs> but, yeah, no, I but the point terrible. is they, that, that molding period of uh, childhood, early childhood has been extended out into people's adulthood yeah. and for, a, for a lot of people. They are, they, they keep themselves at a certain level of psychological development or it's, <laughs> their influence to stay at a certain level of psychological development. And there are methods for achieving that. I mean, we've been talking about ideas that have existed really deep philosophical, spiritual, metaphysical truths that have existed as known ideas amongst humanity for countless time. And the same, it could be true about methods of manipulation, mind control, population control, social engineering. These are ideas that have the, the core tenets of how these things are done have existed amongst power hierarchies like religions forever, but they're only getting more ramped up as big data gives them big data and technological connectivity, give them even more pipelines straight into the prime real estate in our time, which is the space in your mind. Right. But I, <laughs> I want to talk about a little bit about archetypes as the way of, mapping out the architecture of the psyche Mm -hmm. and young is a great, a really great person to study. I don't know how much you've got into young on your show because it's part psychology, part philosophy, maybe not pure philosophy. Right. Psychology stuff is definitely more to come, but he's going to be one of my first ones that I focus on, but no, I haven't really covered him that much at all. Well, I would consider him probably for sure an idealist at heart Mm -hmm. in his philosophy but archetypes are one of the most important concepts that he was able to bring to a larger audience of critical thinkers. And archetypes can be understood as certain mental formations, ideas, um, specific ideas, characterological traits that exist in each person and express themselves through the person and to the person through the world. So it's a big word that is used in a lot of different ways. And even I myself probably don't always use the word in the pure, correct sense, but you could say that Jung was talking about how everything we experience is in images derived from this primary imagination that I talked about earlier. Mm -hmm. And he really flowed on the idea of the conscious and the unconscious that Freud kicked off for everybody. And uh, the, way of looking at the conscious and unconscious as the primary two archetypes everything else splits from is akin to looking at 
the self you are now, like the small ego whirlpool in the stream self versus the infinite, total, oceanic, cosmic, empirical self. But also the unconscious could just be all the all of the contents of your mind that you are not currently aware of if you don't want to go to the vast oceanic definition. Because right. we know that our brains, if you're just looking at neuroscience, our brains are holding a lot more information than we're currently paying attention to at any given time. Like a vast, a vast amount more information, data, bits are being processed and understood by our brains at all times that we're only focusing on like one little pinpoint. Right. But from the conscious and unconscious, these primary archetypes are some of the the more uh, prime archetypes within us that I think it's useful for all of us to know that we have and that we exhibit we we behave as these archetypes or we are spoken to in our mind by these archetypes all the time. And sometimes when you're thinking to yourself, you might only consider that you're thinking to just yourself. But actually, if you start looking at yourself as being made up of these archetypes, you can you can start to realize when, oh, this is the one that's talking to me right now. Do I want to listen to that guy or do I want to be that guy right now? And yeah, that can be point. really helpful. And then you're not just seeing it as like, these thoughts are me. And this is what I really think. Or this is what I really feel. You're talking to different, different archetypes within yourself at all times, whether or not maybe you realize it. I personally think this is the case. But the first one is the persona, the mask that we present to the world, especially in different social situations. It's not exactly a bad archetype necessarily. You can have a healthy ego or a healthy persona. But it can also go very wrong. And I think the point in our development where we develop the persona is around the time where Freud would have described the creation of the superego as a part of our psyche. And the Mm -hmm. superego, as I identify it here, is the part of us, the voice in our head that tells us what other people think of us. So the point in life where maybe you're three, four years old, maybe younger, I don't know exactly, but you realize not only do I see them, but they see me and they are thinking about me. They're judging me perhaps. So this voice of the superego is usually for most people what creates the persona archetype, the version of themselves that they feel that they want to be or they feel they must be or they maybe even feel that they are in some cases. And again, it's not an evil part of us necessarily but if our if if our persona is so completely created by the fear of what other people think i think we can all recognize times in our life when that was causing us problems (laughs) where that causes us to act inauthentically so being aware of the persona (laughs) is important like i mentioned earlier i really wanted people to think i was cool and smart by by being a podcaster that's part of the persona and it's so once you realize you have the persona then you can maybe start crafting it more consciously and it'll be a much better persona (laughs) yeah the second part is well do you mind do you want to pop in there well yeah just like real quick is do i like connect it maybe for the audience more too is it's kind of like what i know we talked about this a little bit on the, the last podcast but this idea of like a balancing act too is like you become aware of the persona so that you can you can kind of frame it the way you want, but recognize that it plays an important role. If I'm, I would say, maybe this is just my interpretation I might be wrong on, almost like driving you towards acting. So it's like become conscious of yeah. it, but also in a way embrace the many aspects of it. But can, please continue. <laughs> no, I think we should actually go talk more about this in the superego. Maybe not jump, maybe not fly right past it. Because okay, as yeah. far as getting into this material, it might be the most relevant to what we were talking about earlier with, you know, your observance of religions being so, so destructive and dogmas being so destructive. And like, how are people able to just go along with this and, and um, mm-hmm. not question? And it, it totally does derive from this superego thing, which the very first voice of the superego in our head is of our parents, I would say. And yeah. get, uh, that can be positive or negative. Sometimes your parents have great advice. Sometimes the, the voice of the superego pops in and warns you that if you do this right now, you're going to look like an asshole. That's a good thing to know. So don't, you know, just like don't kill your ego, don't kill your superego, but neither should be your master. And right. when it comes to a lot of people's superegos that are currently enthralled by various forms of mind control that exist on the world right now, 
it's like an artificial intelligence. It, the advertising agencies and our consumer culture has gotten so good at getting in, getting their hooks into people through the through the super ego that mm-hmm. it's actually fucking ridiculous. Like to me, that is what Agreed. AI is all about. It's about installing an a thinking separate entity in people's minds that is going to get them to behave in the way that the the social engineer or the controller wants them to behave. So yeah. I think that's really like the origin point of, I mean, it's the shadow is important next step to, to look at because the, it has to do with why we would be too afraid to uh, do anything other than the superego says. <laughs> but I think that it's a, it's a sound explanation for a big part of what we're seeing when it comes to the monsters of religions. I agree. And, and actually I want to like start using this more because you explain it well, is that I, I like to whenever, because the free will and determinism subject still gets brought up around me sometimes. However, I'm not like a huge fan of that discussion because I kind of think it's a little bit too oversimplified. But what I do like to say to, I think is persuasive because some people aren't, aren't persuaded by this idea that, Hey, like all basically all you have this, whole subconscious side of you leading you towards your decisions. But something I do find that they're persuaded on the subconscious side is kind of what you were saying. It's like all these ads we have around us, these ad agencies, what the corporations are putting out there, what even the government puts out there. There's criticism on both sides of those issues, right? What they put out there is it, it affects your subconscious. Like you just see an image and you're like, Oh, you like think nothing of it. You're kind of, you're kind of, conscious brain there is is oh whatever but it goes it registers into your subconscious so then all of a sudden like you connect it with another image later and all of a sudden that drives you to act and now that's what the corporations and stuff have figured out with advertising is how do we persuade your basically your subconscious they would never say this because then people would be like oh that's that's fucking mind control so i never would use this language but in a way it kind of is it's like they've figured out a way to get you to act towards consumption so how do they do that? They plan their little advertisements in a certain way to affect what we we're kind of talking about, your persona, to affect that that super ego, and then to get you to act and buy. So to, to like bring it back to the free will and determinism subject, it's really hard for me to say, or it should be hard for people to say, or at least be skeptical to the idea of free will when, hey, your choices aren't actually your own because there's people that are just feeding things into the back of your mind to use back in your mind in a, in a vague way, just to oversimplify it into the back of your mind to get you to act in a certain way. How is that free will? So to, that's the way my way of connecting the persona idea to some philosophy. Yeah. But the, what I would say is you have the immediate cure to the poison with the knowledge, <laughs> right? Oh yeah. That's a good, you know, even, yeah. even if that cure, that cure to what is stealing your free will takes a while to work. Eventually mm-hmm. it will. I mean, you're not going to learn these things about how you yourself work and not be able to just start almost automatically putting them into practice. Right. It's that's the beauty of wisdom. That's actually <laughs> true and real and useful, or at the very least close to it. I Agreed. won't say that everything that young said was completely right. I definitely wouldn't say that. Right. I, disagree with lots of Freud, but there are some things that Freud re- realized that were completely important and, and impactful to on at least. Yeah. Yeah. For many thinkers to come after him. So that like any teacher I bring up or someone I quote, of course I don't wholesale believe everything they say, but right. I do love, I do love looking at the archetypes of the self as Jung described them. And mm-hmm. yeah, the, I don't know if I answered why we have free will as clearly as I could have. That might be a whole nother uh, right. <laughs> like line of questioning to get into. Well, that, Suffice yeah, that, to say, if you think that you don't have free will, then you've definitely closed yourself off to it, which is unfortunate. Well, that's why I always say is is like because I I don't. That's why I don't like don't put oh shit I don't put myself on one side or the other is because I think the conversation that often occurs in Western philosophy, for example of free will and determinism, they oversimplify the two. There's like, they're both have something important to say on each of their sides, 
but they don't come together and combine those. And to me, there's a really important combination where I think we could bring into some of the stuff we were talking about with Young here. It like we don't have to today, but like the point is, is like there's important aspects that help unite that. If if both sides would just look at some psychology stuff, they'd realize that hey, both are actually kind of right to some extent, and both are actually kind of wrong. So that's that's the way I like sum it up. Some people would call that a cop out answer, but I'm like, no, these things are not black and white. We can't just yeah. Anyway, <laughs> not to get too <laughs> off topic. Yeah, it's uh, to me. It's as you say, there are things that are out of your direct control and that Mm -hmm. might be the things of the primary imagination, but then you have the secondary imagination of capacity to act with agency and create. And there's no way that I can look at someone's completely amazing, unique 70 hour long painting project, this visionary artwork depicting some higher spiritual realm of consciousness in a most beautiful way I've ever seen. I can never. I could never look at that and go, "Oh, that's just the result of all the uh, processes and uh, you know pressures and stimulus that were acting on that particular person, and they had no bearing on it themselves at all." <laughs> right. I would just be like, I feel like that would be ridiculous. But you know, there are things that are out of our control, or that just are, and think things flow in the direction that they're flowing, and they're, both are true. Like you said, they're there is free will and then some things are determined and that's, I think it's better that way actually, yeah. as far as making things interesting. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and, and my, my always, my understanding too is, is like, we're going to operate as though we have free will anyway. And it's important to operate that way. Cause like, for example, maybe, maybe I'll think of this example here is like art, for example, you know, sometimes if people aren't, I would say th- there's a way that, you can like learn almost to love art. You can make a conscious effort to love art and become like more aware of it. See how you feel when you interpret it, that type of stuff. And there's also a way where you just like look at the art and you just mindlessly go by and you're like, Oh, that's cool. And you go on, but then you sometimes it hits you without you choosing one way or the other. That's also true. But there's also like a way to make that happen. I think with like a conscious effort almost is like you try to, you basically you be, do you, you, start becoming in the, in the present moment in a way you start becoming more aware and then you start like taking that in. So maybe there's like a better chance of that happening in some sense. So it's about, it's like you still have to kind of control your mind in a way, but it goes back to, you have the ability to control your mind in that way. If we make the conscious effort. So, but yeah, there are also some great artists that have spoken on or written about how, when they were writing their novel, I'm thinking of Tolkien, who I'm in a serious obsession with currently. I always have been, but especially lately, he would actually talk about going into sort of trance-like state when he was coming up with elvish histories and songs about ancient times. And essentially when he was writing the story of the Lord of the Rings, the story was being told to him. He did not know, like a character would show up, they would say something, they would spit out this, piece of lore that he didn't plan to put in there he had to discover what they were talking about for himself as he kept writing so in a way you could look at that as an argument for determinism in that he's not uh, i guess creating that himself as something that existed in the realm of ideas and he's just pulling it through but you know also you could say that he's choosing through free will to to cast that fishing line into the unknown and pull something out but what's interesting is that in that process, he was able to, while basically just in a flow state, he was able to create something or um, symbolize something that has the feeling of reality. Yeah. It has the feeling of truth. It, the, it has the cohesiveness of real history. And to me, that's the most incredible thing ever is when artists are able to do feats like that, where to me, that's equivalent to the power of the larger total universe mind to imagine the entire world into existence in a way. They're Agreed. doing that like on a fractal, smaller scale. And it's quite <laughs> quite fun to explore that. Yeah. Yeah. And I agree in the sense that too, it's like, it's also comes down to kind of what you were explaining of how you explained it on the free will side or the determinism side, but it's, it's 
the kind of almost like the outcome is what matters, what's really cool, right? And it's almost like those two forms of explaining it, they're just language games of explaining the same outcome, right? That's kind of yeah. like my interpretation. In this the sense. outcome will be what it is either yeah. way. So it's like one of those almost not very useful arguments other than you can maybe give someone a little more self-confidence if you help them decide for themselves that they do have yeah. free will. It can definitely be a defeating feeling to be on the, I think that's why I prefer the free will side Same. overall yeah. is because it's, yeah, it's more defeatist if you're saying that everything's determined and yeah. I'm not ready to, to give up. <laughs> I'm not yeah, ready to let mean. the, uh, let chaos be what controls everything. I yeah. feel like that's actually kind of a decent segue to talking a little bit more about some of the primary Jungian archetypes yeah. and different voices you can hear in your head that you might mistake as being, your empirical self, but they're actually, it's this type of fragment of yourself. The next important one would be the shadow, which is deriving from the unconscious. And it's all the parts of ourself that we would consider unacceptable or scary, like certain sex drives that maybe aren't socially encouraged or instincts that would cause you to like brutally do something brutal. Like, you know, the fact that you have the instinct to, fight someone to the death if you had to. The mm -hmm. negative traits and, and elements of chaos all get just rolled up into this thing called the shadow. And why it is important is not because uh, it's not because we need to like look at this as this scary separate thing that is part of us that we can't control. It's the shadow. Oh no. It's actually more important to realize it's there because how it operates most of the time is to project on others these traits as a part of denying them as being a part of ourself. So it's a mm -hmm. tried and true thing that you'll probably hear from a good, a good new age teacher that what you see as wrong with others is something you should work on in yourself rather than criticize or judge them for it. Well, exactly. I'll say that it's actually quite healthy to have discernment about what you see as shadow elements of a, another person, but also to see how those traits exist in yourself. Cause you probably wouldn't even be picking up on them or noticing them if they weren't close to the bubbling top point of your mind, because they've been trying to bubble up and you're repressing them and trying to bury them. And the other important thing about this concept of projection, which is far less frequently talked about is that positive traits, even more often than negative traits are what, are part of the shadow. Positive traits can be a part of the shadow. If you believe about yourself, oh, I'm not a good artist or I don't have a good imagination or I can't do this, I can't do that, you are pushing that that part of your self-expression into your shadow. And then whenever you see and idolize someone else who does do that thing, who is a great guitar player or whatever it is, mm -hmm. you are basically sep creating a separation from yourself and that ability or that expression and you're giving it all to them and not that we shouldn't lavish praise on right. great artists, but we should, what we should be inspired by about great art and great artists is the part of ourself that could have done something like that, or that is capable of bridging and using that secondary imagination superpower the way right. that the person that you so adore was able to. So that's maybe even more important than all the negative side of the shadow is to realize that you are actually burying an infinity of positive traits into your shadow until you mine them out and explore them for yourself. Agreed. Yeah, that's, I think that's a great summary. And yeah, I'm always, that's like the one concept of, of him that I'm kind of more well aware of is the idea of the shadow and, and yeah, that's kind of the way I interpret it too, is it's almost like not only are you denying those traits for yourself, those positive traits you could have, you're also, I also find that people say, oh, it's like they're natural at it. It's like an excuse. Talented. Yeah, they're talented. Yeah, I hate that word. They're gifted. I mean, yeah, people have aptitudes this. and gifts. That's true. But I hate that excuse that they're yeah, talented. Exactly. I'm not. It's like, I, I like no doubt deny that I do think like some people are more, you know, like with everyone's artistic. Cause like, there's so many forms of art that you can find one that you're, you're gifted for. So I do agree that some people maybe are more gifted for certain types of art. However, that doesn't mean that you can't, like a person can't do it at some point. Like, I guess my way of explaining this is 
maybe some people take more time to be to actualize what their form of art is. But the point is, it's like it's still a potential for you. So if you deny it too much and, you know, that that shadow aspect, that's the problem. The point is, is we all can actualize it. It's like, are you going to make excuses and say, oh, they're just gifted? Or are you going to like try to actually put in the effort, basically? Right. And that's part of what integrating the shadow is about, is actually drawing out those positive traits, not just corralling the negative traits. Right. Yeah. <laughs> being aware, but being aware of the parts of yourself that you, you know, it's like for me, I have in my life been a copious interrupter and mostly unconscious of it. Mm -hmm. but annoyed when other people interrupted. And then I finally realized, oh, that's something that I do constantly. (laughs) No wonder I find it so annoying. And like maybe it's something my dad did a lot that I watched happen. And so maybe there's some imprinting there for whatever, not not to make that an excuse, but excuse me. Uh, The last thing I want to say about the shadow, though, is the the creation of the one dimensional human <laughs> as we see it in modern society, in people that are trapped in dogmatic religious structures or even super cults, which is that if you get somebody into purely the persona, mechanistic, ego, material, material based physical world life, um, worker drone type of existence, essentially. And You give them all kinds of others, whether it's people of other races, people of other countries, all kinds of others to put their shadow on. Mm. You're and they're not engaging with their creativity. They're not engaging with their unconscious. They're only creative insofar as it serves the master that they're serving. Then you've create you've actually basically completely expelled the shadow from your being, which means all the positive things that are in the unconscious are now completely disconnected from you. It is the opposite of the bridging that the artist is able to do. And that's why the artist is usually so allergic to having a regular nine to five, five days a week, month in, month out, year after year type of job. Yeah, because, cog. yeah, it just, one does not work with the other. So, while you can have consistency and discipline and even work at the same thing for a long time on a schedule as an artist, there's a, there's a different motivator, I guess, for the vocational person versus the vocational person as in the person that's following their, their creative passion versus the occupational person mm. or even the purely recreational person who is <laughs> – for whatever reason, doesn't have the survival needs to have to be the cog in the wheel, but they exist as a World of Warcraft character for 90% of their life and nothing else. Right. I've been there too. (laughs) And But both the recreational slave and the occupational slave serve the same consumer culture master, if you will. Yeah, and to kind of like branch off your point about kind of placing it as it or placing the shadow in some other place, basically on some other person, some other group of people, like you kind of said, what you, you gave me the thought of, you know, that's like one way of suppressing it in a sense. Right. But the other interesting way to maybe bring this almost full circle is a problem with the new age stuff is the nine to five job. There's a lot of, there's, there's people motivated to do the whole meditation and become all like centered and peaceful and blah, 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 blah. They do all that. Why? To increase productivity in their nine to five and to get that promotion and (laughs) to work towards this end goal. Right. So it's almost like they're suppressing their shadow by utilizing something that's actually really helpful, but they're utilizing it in this really backwards way. That's, I hate to say something's not intended for something because you can do whatever the fuck you want with it, but they're using it in a way that is suppressing that shadow. Maybe. I think you're absolutely right because a lot of those type of mindfulness meditation practices are teaching the person that whenever a thought comes in your mind, just vaporize it, get rid of it. It doesn't exist. You're relaxed. (laughs) You're, you're completely relaxed. It's fine. And actually you need those tumultuous thoughts. If you're going to break free from, the cage you're in. Mm-hmm. <laughs> they're, they're part of the, they actually have energy. They motivate you. It's not, but the key element of mindfulness that should really be 
thought and practice isn't to get rid of all thought. How it is a good practice to be able to just completely calm your mind and not have your thoughts plaguing you. Of Mm -hmm. course, you know, you don't want to be rattling the cage till your hands are bleeding in your, in your head. You, you got to get still and quiet and formulate a plan to get out of there. Sure. But yeah, completely like, I think you're, you're right. It's part of smoothing out the shadow, ironing it out and creating a one dimensional, perfect worker drone AI installed in their head, uh, wage slave. <laughs> to, yeah. I, I don't know how else to put it. I, it. It does work that way. And I think that it does come through the new age movement in the form that it does meditation for that purpose from the people that have funded and created some of the larger elements behind this movement, behind the various movements. I, I think it's subversive actually. And that's a part of the danger of com- taking those, those practices in a purely secular sense out of their context. Not that you need to go and become a Hindu or something, but if you were learning meditation from someone who was actually well-versed in the Vedas and understood Vedanta, like the person that I interviewed most recently on my show, Acharya Shunya, hmm. she would also be filling like she would also be filling the gaps <laughs> for you with the deeper esoteric understanding of what your mind even is, who you are, right. why you're here. Not that you should be telling you that she would be asking you the questions that would lead you there yourself. And is, yeah, it's like the and that's really aspect. important. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So not that you need to become that religion, but that completely secular, secularizing it is weaponizing it in some ways. But, but it, the cat's out of the bag. I think like for the most part, most of the, most of the ground level truths of what people spread in the new age movement are still way more useful than beliefs, limiting belief systems that they might've been coming from. Right. So I'm I overall agree. still for it for sure. I'm, I'm for, yeah. I'm for this big explosion in spiritual curiosity. I'm, I'm really all for that. I love that 20, 2020 is weird in a lot of good ways. And the last couple of years I've, I've seen people out in public that I would have never expected to talking about things I would have never imagined to hear them talking about things that I thought I would, I was lucky to have those type of conversations <laughs> and I had to make it happen by being a podcast host. But now, yeah, the, the limiters are falling away. I think the interconnected level of knowledge that we're able to spread and share on the planet at this time is just outpacing the, uh, the bullshit because yeah. the liars have to tell more lies to keep their lies, their web of lies intact and functioning, but the truth stands on its own and whatever lies there are out there are doomed to fail. And they always do before sooner or later. Yeah. I 100% agree with that because like not to turn this into a topic or anything, but because I, I feel like we're reaching a good endpoint. But uh, it's like kind of the idea of the internet, in a sense, is is it helps dispel that those negative aspects because people can go seek out and figure out. Oh wait, no, there's all this other whole other school of thought. I guess you could say there are all these other ideas that kind of dispel what I being what I'm being told. And all it takes is a quick Google search. You can like even like typing in like. What's the problem with X form of meditation that maybe is like popular in some corporation over simplifying, but I think people will get the point. And all of a sudden you get all these articles probably of a new perspective. It's kind of like the beauty in that is like this information allows for this kind of I feel like almost more open society in a sense that's heading towards a spiritual movement. So yeah, there's a lot of bullshit in there, but there's a lot of good stuff coming out of it as well. Yeah. Overall, more good than bad, especially that people are curious. Yep. Yeah. And I think that the uh, bogus teachers are usually, they usually trip themselves up in some way before they, I mean, they might get really large followings, but anyone that was actually, uh, you know, interested in someone's work that ended up being like this, that ended up being like a, a lame person or a bad person, they'll still be able to distill the good things that came out of that. And right you know, no person is even 100% good or bad. 
And I think that's just important to know that we could talk more about in the future about some of the other archetypes of the self and <laughs> that yeah. would be pretty fun. And maybe some more of, I would really love to get into some of the uh, ideas of hermetic principles and not something that I take wholesale, but some that are really useful that yeah. would tie into what we've been talking about really 100%. well. So I, <laughs> I actually created notes for our conversation and I think I only touched I was just one, I was thinking that too. one fourth of my notes. I don't know. I guess I overprepared, but I was really excited for this conversation because I, I knew we'll we were going to have another one. Yeah, I'd love to. I'd love to. Please have me back. I've got, I've already got the notes. <laughs> yeah, no, no. We'll, we for sure will. And I like knew once we hit like, what are we at now? We're almost we're, to two yeah, hours, we're almost dude. to two hours. That's why I was like, all right, let's, this is like a good segue. We tied it to the beginning. Let's, we can redo it. We can do another one. Um, yeah, I was like, once we hit, like, I, I looked over and it was an hour. I was like, we're not even going to get through a quarter of what you wanted. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, maybe like the, the ending thought is, and, th- and this is, this is like recognizing our privilege here in the United States. Cause this isn't the case everywhere in the world. Uh, it's, it's a growing part of the world. This is the case, but here in the U S I largely believe that we have the choice to be ignorant in a sense. Like we have that choice. And, and then what I mean by that is, is like, you know, like what we were just talking about, there's information out there that you can figure out that, Oh, Hey, what I'm doing here, this is, this part's full of shit. Like I need to be mindful of that. There's like all this other ideas around it to help explain this, fill in the gaps. They help maybe like prevent me from being a cog in the machine or whatever. Right. So it's like, that's kind of the, the nice thing we have here. And I don't know, should be grateful for that. I think, I guess. My good buddy, Kurt and a long time permanent podcast supporter, he always says in the age of information, ignorance is a choice. Yep. I totally, totally vibe with that idea. Yep. And it's a great, it's a great thing to realize. <laughs> it means that first of all, you can realize that you're choosing to be ignorant about this or that. And actually, to be fair, there are things that we have to choose to be ignorant on. Yeah. Like I have to rely on so-and-so to bake the bread I eat because I'm busy becoming 100%. not ignorant about this, but yep. We have the capacity to dispel ignorance every day in massive quantities and learn a million new things a day. The fact that I don't teach myself more new skills and things I can physically do than I teach myself ideas is kind of woeful, actually. Mm -hmm. Like you can, you can learn anything. I mean, YouTube, YouTube it. If, especially if it's just like basic life skills, you can, figure out how to fix your sink, change your tire, whatever Mm -hmm. we, we have more ability to be self-reliant than ever before. And the other people around us who we could rely on in need are more equipped to be reliable than ever before. And at the end of the day, the most important thing to be comfortable with life is that you can trust yourself to do what's right for you and what's right to others around you. What's morally right. We talked more about, you know, epistemology and morality over on my show, but if you can trust yourself to be that person, then it doesn't matter what happens, how bad the fire is, you know, that it'll be handled as best as it can be because there's a dependable person there and it's you. And Mm -hmm. that's a great feeling to just accept that and like fold that into your persona make that part of your persona, crafting the persona consciously instead of having the learned helplessness that so many of us are trained on by our current backwards culture. (laughs) Yeah. That's, that's a, I think that's a great, some great ending point. Uh, But also tell, tell the audience where to, I know, I know you're going to be on again, but still you got to tell them where, where do we find you? Oh, yeah. Awesome. I'd love to tell you guys about Interverse a little bit. It's a podcast, not unlike this one, but all conversations. I haven't done many or any solo shows, although maybe I will. It seems like I could take some notes and talk at length on yeah, various things. So it. I'm definitely getting more into interviews, but yeah, the solo ones are it's a good way to not only understand my own thoughts, but also kind of get feedback on them. So I would recommend yeah, I'm going to have to try that out now that there's a little bit of an audience behind us to be mm-hmm. able to hear hear it. And I'm not just talking to myself anymore, but it's been an awesome journey. I've been making Interverse for like three years plus, and 
you can get the, I've talked to people from all kinds of fields, like visionary artists, musicians, spiritual teachers, energy healers, really the, (laughs) I've talked to all kinds of people. I don't really put a limiter on what I might talk about other than it's my goal to inspire you as a listener with somebody who I think exemplifies being not a cog in the machine, but a conscious actor in on the stage of life, mm-hmm. you know, doing what they are feeling like they're here to do and enjoying it and inspiring us with whatever that is. So, yeah, I mean, sometimes we talk about conspiracy stuff. Sometimes we talk about deep philosophy stuff. Sometimes I just hang out with uh, a musician I like and the conversation is a little more free and, and uh, random, but yeah. I think that you can learn something from anybody. So podcasting is a, Absolutely. a brilliant tool that we've got in this day and age. And I hope you guys check out mine. It's on every platform in the known internet. So Spotify, YouTube, SoundCloud, iTunes podcast app, you name it, you can find it there. And interversepodcast.com will take you to all the links to all those different places to play it. And last but not least, if you end up digging the show, you can always become a plus member for my show, which gets you two hour episodes instead of one hour episodes. And it's the only way that I get any support for all the effort I put into the show because I refuse to do advertising because I don't like to hold people's attention hostage for anything that they're not there for. <laughs> anyway, I think that about covers it. Um, Dope. I love you guys to follow me on Instagram and say hi or something. Do um, it. Definitely become a plus member. If you like the show, that would be really great. And thank you for letting me talk a bunch. <laughs> I love having the tables turn and being a guest because my biggest problem on the show is not being able to uh, spit out all the things that I want to say because I'm trying to give room to the guest and right. people are there for the guest a little bit. But this time I got to <laughs> stretch out the old tongue flap and talk a lot. It was really fun. Thanks oh, yeah. for giving me the space. And I even learned some stuff. I mean, you had some ways of looking at what we were talking about that I had not thought of before a couple of times. My mind got blown 